Let's bring in our first guest for the hour. We've got Ross Gerber, Gerber Kawasaki Wealth and Investment Management CEO. And, and Ross, uh, we were expecting big numbers from Disney Plus here, but 96 million, 95 million subscribers, well ahead of the 90 million the street was expecting. Were you surprised? I wasn't surprised about the Disney Plus numbers because the content's so good. I mean, if you think about what we were watching at Christmas and between The Mandalorian and, and Soul, which was just a great, beautiful mu movie, um, it's an extremely compelling complement to Netflix, which is basically filled with a lot of, you know, sort of violent films and TV shows and murder shows. So it's great to have the Disney Plus uh, content for our children and also for myself because I just can't watch a murder show every night. Um, so, so that part wasn't that su 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 uh, surprising. Uh, what about, you know, the other names in that portfolio? We talk about ESPN Plus and Hulu. Uh, those also showing relative strength. They're coming in above expectations in terms of paying users. How important are those going to be as we move forward? Super important because, first of all, Hulu's done really well from the ad supported side. So they have subscribers, but they're really growing from an ad supported. Not everybody wants to pay $5 a month and people are fine with that. So they've got a solution with Hulu and live TV solution there as well. And ESPN plus has really done well, actually, you know, a lot of that driven by UFC. I'm not a huge UFC fan because of the violence, but, but I get it. And, and it drives a lot of, uh, you know, very engaged viewers and, and it's really helped you know, double the size of ESPN Plus. But when you look at a reoccurring revenue model that these apps have created, it's a much, much better system for the entertainment companies longer term. And so Disney successfully um, adapted this new model and, and it's really exciting for the company. So Ross, when you look at the whole streaming portfolio, we're talking about 146 million, roughly 150 million subscribers. You look at Netflix's numbers, it's at 204 million right now. What do you think is the catalyst for Disney to get it to that next level? Well, I think it's just about opening up new markets. I mean, every family in the world with children you watches Disney content pretty much. So, so as you open more markets and there's more awareness, um, I think that drives you know sales. But I think the next step really is actually opening the theme parks again because all their products are synergistic. And so the more people in the theme park, uh, parks leads to more people uh, buying Disney Plus, you know, and 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 then more people watching Disney Plus drives more people to the theme parks. So the fact that the the real profit driver of their business is actually closed and they're and they're profitable or break even is really a testament to the great management of Disney Bob Chapek doing a great job and of course Iger above that you know looking down doing a wonderful job Ross, let's talk about valuation here too though because we saw Bank of America raising their price target to 223 from 192 uh, we've talked about the parks and what kind of boost that'll have once they reopen and allow people back in more fully. Um, but how do you put their 32% year over year gain, you know, in, I guess, in the context of what we saw in the broader market? Well, I was kind of happy about that because Disney was the worst stock I had last year. So I had a lot of things working last year except for Disney. And at the end of the year, obviously, we've got a great pop. You know, we value Disney at where it's at today. You, you know, uh, quite frankly, it's surprising the stock has done so well with so much of their profit drivers really shut. And and honestly, it's going to be some time before these assets really get back to full speed. So, you know, I think what the market is saying is when Disney's back, it's actually a way better company than before the pandemic. And I think we're seeing this with valuations with a lot of different businesses like MGM Resorts as well, where the bricks and mortar business has been, you know, altered with an online component now. But the hybrid, you know, end of these businesses when this is all over will be much better than before the pandemic. So sometimes these huge shocks in our society create better adaptable businesses. And Disney's going to be one of them, I think. I mean, having said that, when you look at the quarter for parks and experiences, we're talking about a $119 million operating loss. And yes, we've been talking about this for several quarters now because of the pandemic. But uh, when, in fact, things do open back up, especially where you are in California, how significant a lift does that provide to the stock, especially when you consider that a lot of this trades right now on the momentum from Disney Plus? 
Yeah, and I think that's priced in. I think you know the the stock is priced in that stuff will open this summer and and we'll have much better results from Disney throughout this year. So look at it this way: the worst is behind Disney. You know, so there's no doubt in my mind the worst is behind. Now, currently in LA, we have no vaccine, so we're making no progress. 200 people died today in LA. No vaccines to give out. And it's really distressing. And this is the legacy of the Trump administration's failure. But Biden is on it. And and I expect that by summer, we'll have a lot of society vaccinated and they'll be back in these parks like as many people as they'll be allowed to have. So so I think that's already priced in the stock. But I think as we move forward, boy, profits could really soar in 2022. And, and we'll have to wait and see what happens. Ross, I also wanted to ask you about cannabis stocks because it's been a crazy week yeah. uh, for those names, especially when you look at the Canadian names here today. Uh, Tilray bouncing back from that near 50% loss yesterday, but year over year, or just even year to date, uh, the Canadian ETF still yeah. up 75%. What are you making the moves? Well, you know, unfortunately, you know this industry well. I mean, the Canadian players are not the, the game. It's uh, the U.S. I mean, legalization is coming in the United States, and the, the, the impact of this is enormous. If, if you go back to 1933 and you could invest in alcohol companies, how do you think you did over the last you know, 80 years or 90 years? You've done amazing. So here you can get into this great business that's much less harmful than tobacco or alcohol, which already has you know, tens, if not 100 million users in the United States. And, and, and it's just the biggest opportunity I've seen in a traditional business in my career. So we are heavily invested here in US MSO operators, not Canadian players. So please, if you're just looking at chat boards and you don't know what you're doing, you know, please, you know, pay attention to what you own because you want to be in US cannabis companies for sure. That was the surprising thing for me too, is just kind of watching Wall Street bets, uh, Reddit forum there, talking so much about Sundial, Tilray, the Canadian names. Yeah. I think it's just because these ones yeah. trade over the counter, right? So people don't know the right. names. That's but, correct. Um, they just can't buy them. I mean, they can't buy them. Yeah. So, I mean, when we look at that and the opportunity in the space, what is the timeline for you? Because still a lot of question marks. We hear from Democrats saying they want to push legalization, fix these issues. But uh, they've been saying that for a while now. I know they just got control in the Senate. But how do you see it playing out? Because David Klein at Canopy says this is the year they'll see federal laws change. I absolutely agree. A hundred percent. So here's the, the order. We've got to deal with, obviously, the treason that we've seen in our nation. That's happening right now. And then we've got to get money to people in need. That's happening right now. And then the next issue is social equity in this country. When we look at what's happened in the last year with Black Lives Matter movement, which is really a bigger thing, which is about the, the lingering racism and institutional racism in our country that's purported by Jim Crow laws like cannabis. There's no doubt in my mind, if you look at the history of of cannabis laws. It's simply to oppress African-American communities, minority communities. It's been used for since the Civil War for this. And it is time it ends. And, and I will not stop until it ends. And we must expunge records. Kamala Harris gets it. Joe Biden gets it. The Senate gets it. The House gets it. We need to create you know, fair banking laws. Cannabis is not heroin. It's absurd. Um, so this Jim Crow law is going to end, and the sooner the better. Ross Gerber, CEO of Gerber Kawasaki Wealth and Investment Management. It's good to talk to you. Have a good weekend.